let me say, a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. I hesitate to instruct so learned an authority as your new president on the thinking of Blessed John Paul II, so I've chosen the safer ground of the 19th century. I, um, John Henry Newman and Leo XIII were the church's outstanding theologians and their, the most significant personalities in the church in that century. I want to say something about each of them. My talk has two halves, and the first one is about Newman, and the second one is about Leo. And the first one I want to talk about the spirit of freedom that's proper to a Catholic university. And the second half is about Leo and a spirit of a different sort. Are we still Sorry, working on that? It's a little closer. A little closer. Okay. Is that better still? Grand. Okay, so let me start with Newman and the spirit of academic freedom. Uh, Newman's best known work is a set of lectures that he gave when he was setting up a new Catholic university in Ireland. <clears throat> They're published under the name The Idea of a University. Many of you have probably read it. One of Newman's principal themes was an argument against the system of secular and utilitarian education that was begun with the establishment of the University of London in 1825 or 26. Oxford and Cambridge universities were restricted to members of the Church of England and as a practical matter to members of the upper class. UCL, as it's now known, was open to everyone, Catholics and Jews included, <coughs> and on principle did not teach theology. Its founders were also inspired by the ideas of Jeremy Bentham and uh, stressed the notion that education should be utilitarian. In the mid-19th century, Trinity College Dublin was, like Oxford and Cambridge, an Anglican institution. It was the only college at the only university in Ireland. And in 1845, Sir Robert Peel's government proposed creating three what we now call Queen's Colleges in Belfast and Cork and Limerick. And they would be secular on the model of UCL. Pius IX condemned the idea, as did the Irish bishops. It wasn't that they were against education for Catholics, quite the contrary, but they thought that leaving out theology was a bad way to go about liberalizing admissions. The Catholic University of Ireland, the one that Newman was to lead, was the alternative that they preferred. So Newman's lectures make the case for including theology in the curriculum of any university that's worthy of the name. But he also makes an argument that might be of more um, modern, I might say contemporary interest against the vision of these schools that education should be uh, utilitarian, that it should prepare students for a job. He famously argued in Discourse 5 that knowledge was its own end. He said the main purpose of a university in its treatment of its students was the formation of a habit of mind of which the attributes are freedom, equitableness, calmness, moderation, and wisdom. And in answer to the question, what is the use of it, he replied, knowledge is not merely a means to something beyond it, but an end sufficient to rest in and to pursue for its own sake. You might object that this vision, however well suited to an elite that didn't need to worry about where their next job was coming from, was maybe too utopian for the less uh, well-off students who would be populating the new colleges. And that's an interesting debate which I don't propose to have here. I, I'm interested in Newman's view of the intellectual life of a Catholic university, how our being Catholic bears on how we do our work. So I'd like to take his account of the university and its students and the church at face value. The work of the university, he said, is to form habits of mind useful in the pursuit of knowledge. The habits that he talks about include freedom, moderation, wisdom, and some qualities of temperament that are suitable to the academic life, equitableness and calmness. I'm especially interested in the conjunction of freedom with wisdom and knowledge. 
contemporary critics of Catholic higher education worry that faith and religious authority will impinge on academic freedom. Newman um, implies that they won't. Indeed, he believes that freedom of inquiry is one of those habits a Catholic university like his own and like our own should inculcate in its students. I share Newman's belief. I, I would like in the first half of my talk to make two points about it. The first concerns the basis for our shared belief. And the second is about the way in which a free culture can be authentically Catholic. So let me start with the first, about the basis for our shared belief. The, the academic practice of free inquiry is not the same thing as the political right of free speech. It, it has a wider scope. The political right is concerned only with government restrictions, laws and regulations, and courts' actions. But they both rest, I think, on a belief that freedom is the surest path to truth. Consider John Milton's Areopagitica, which people often read in their undergraduate philosophy classes. Areopagitica is a tract that was written to condemn censorship during the English Civil War. Milton um, didn't defend freedom, as people sometimes today do, as the, uh, the path to each man's bliss, whatever that might be. He believed in God, and he thought that freedom was the surest path to truth. There's, here's the famous passage that people always quote from Areopagitica. And though all the winds of doctrine were let loose to play upon the earth, so truth be in the field, we do injuriously by licensing and prohibiting to misdoubt her strength. Let her and falsehood grapple, whoever knew truth put to the worse in a free and open encounter. Her confuting is the best and surest suppressing. So this, this matches well with Newman's own view in his ninth lecture, Newman talks about the duties of the church towards, no, towards knowledge, and he has this to say about the concerns that scientists might express. As to physical science, he says, of course there can be no real collision between it and Catholicism. Nature and grace, reason and revelation, come from the same divine author whose works cannot contradict each other. And later, the church has no call to watch over and protect science. Newman's liberality on the subject of science stems in part from a confidence which he shares with, Newton, with, with Milton that, that reason and revelation can't contradict each other. It also rests on an understanding that the two, uh, religion and science, are, are different systems of explanation. This is a phenomenon we're all familiar with. A lawyer might say that Stagger Lee killed Billy Lyons about a $5 Stetson hat a psychiatrist might say that he killed him because his mother hadn't given him enough attention. And this might be true, but it would not be admissible in court as an explanation. And in the same way, Newton says, a theologian speaking about divine omnipotence simply sets aside the possibility that God might be restrained by the laws of nature. And a physicist calculating the motion of the stars would see questions about their first or final cause as an illogical interruption. Newman has similar things to say about the importance of free inquiry in the liberal arts. Here he sounds thoroughly modern. He dismisses, for example, the suggestion that university students should be fed a strict diet of Christian literature. Here's what he says. I say, if literature is to be made a study of human nature, you cannot have a Christian literature. It's a contradiction in terms to attempt a sinless literature of sinful man. Nay, I'm obliged to go further still, even if we could. Still, we should be shrinking from our plain duty did we leave out literature from education. If a university is a direct preparation for this world, let it be what it professes. It is not a convent, it is not a seminary. There are two points here. L literature is our history and a strictly religious account of our life would be incomplete. We can't tell the whole truth unless we can range freely. The other point is that education fails to prepare us for life in the world if it omits essential truths about mankind. Newton continues, or um, Newman continues, today a pupil, tomorrow a member of the great world, 
today confined to the lives of the saints, tomorrow thrown upon Babel without any rule given for discriminating what is innocent and from what is poison. So uh, that's, that's my first point about the spirit of freedom proper to a Catholic university. Um, talk now about my second point, how a free culture can be authentically Catholic. Uh, what I've been saying, you may be thinking, sounds fine and open-minded, but if Catholic universities give equal liberty to the full spectrum of human thought, what's to distinguish them from their secular counterparts? To this, I think uh, the first part of my answer has three um, parts, and let me begin with the one that is in some ways the most important. And allow me to introduce it with this homely analogy. Suppose that you have recently arrived from Barentsburg, Norway. It's, it's well north of the Arctic Circle. And I have undertaken to introduce you to the game of golf. I explain that it's essential that you avoid going outside the white stakes because the penalty for doing that is stroke and distance. And you should also avoid the yellow stakes, um, which indicate water hazards, and the red stakes, which indicate lateral water, water hazards, because both of those may cost you a stroke. And sand traps are bad too, though they don't have penalties attached to being in them. If you ground your club, there's a penalty, and in any case, they're hard to get out of, and you often can't go very far. And that's golf, I would say. <laughs> uh, my visitor from Berensburg might say that this sounds like a punishing and unpleasant game. <laughs> what, what with all the, the penalties and pitfalls, and so it does if you approach it that way. What I should do instead is to explain that the object of the game is to get the ball from the tee to the hole in the fewest possible strokes, going along the fairways and greens, and enjoying the view and the company as you go along. Uh, that there's a kind of Zen appeal to it because you have to empty your mind of your past troubles and future worries and just live in the moment. Both of these narratives describe the same game, but the first tells what can go wrong, and the second visualizes around as it ought to be played. If I want my Norwegian friend to come along and try it out, the second, I think, is the better sales pitch. Let me try a different analogy. Since his trip to Rio for World Youth Day, Pope Francis has gotten a lot of attention for what I might call his fresh way of putting things. <laughs> he, here is an example. In late September, he gave a long interview to Antonio Spadaro, who is the editor-in-chief of La Civita Cattolica. And in the course of the interview, he said this, a beautiful homily, a genuine sermon, must begin with the first proclamation, with the proclamation of salvation. There's nothing more solid, deep, and sure than this proclamation. Then you have to do catechesis. Then you can draw even a moral consequence. But the proclamation of the saving love of God comes before moral and religious imperatives. Today, sometimes it seems that the opposite order is prevailing. So the first part of my answer to the question, what makes a Catholic university Catholic, is like what Pope Francis has been saying. We must begin with our yes rather than with our no. We have to start by offering to students and faculty a community dedicated to discovering and teaching what is beautiful and true about the Catholic intellectual tradition. That's what will inspire them. When we take inventory periodically of the Catholicity of our universities, we have sometimes a tendency to focus on what Pope Francis calls the moral imperatives. Do Freshman theology teachers communicate the church's teachings on issues of life and marriage. Has the commencement speaker taken a position at odds with the church's fundamental moral principles? Of course, these things are important. That's why we call them moral imperatives. But speaking as a father of five and an educator for 30 years, I would say that there is something that draws young people away from the faith even more surely than an occasional exposure to heterodox opinion. It is growing up in a culture where everybody prefers stuff and sex and self-enhancement and nouvelle cuisine to the love of God. Like it or not, the culture raises our children, as Hillary Clinton says, it takes a village. 
Here's the second part of my answer to how we can be authentically Catholic. If our Catholic universities are to counteract the force of this culture, they must be Catholic through and through and not just in freshman theology. The beauty of the Catholic faith is communicated better in art and music and literature than in freshman theology. The influence of the church on the world we live in is properly the study of history and politics and sociology and anthropology. The message of the Gospels should affect our systems of law and business. We need to convince our students that God came into the world to change it and that he abides with us today in the church and the sacraments. And we need to do that across the curriculum. Newman says something very much like this in his ninth lecture. Though a university, he says, had ever so many theological chairs, that would not suffice to make it a Catholic university. For theology would be included in its teaching only as a branch of knowledge, only as one out of many constituent portions. Rather, he says, let the church do for literature in one way what she does for science in another. Each has its imperfections, and she has a remedy for each. She fears no knowledge, but she purifies all. She represses no element of our nature, but cultivates the whole. This, Newman says, is the lesson he learned from St. Philip Neri, founder of the Congregation of the Oratory to which he belonged. Philip Neri lived in Rome in the mid-16th century, an age, Newman says, as traitorous to the interests of Catholicism as any that preceded it or can follow it. It was a time, he goes on, when a new world of thought and beauty had opened upon the human mind in the discovery of the treasures of classic literature and art. And in this world, Neri, Newman says, saw the great and the gifted dazzled by the enchantress and drinking in the magic of her song. All this he saw and he perceived that the mischief was to be met not with argument, but by means of the great counter fascination of purity and truth. This is also the central message of the Apostolic Constitution Ex Corde Ecclesiae and of the American Catholic bishops' application of Ex Corde Ecclesiae for the United States. And here is my third point about authentic Catholicism. The most important sentence in the application and in the particular is this particular norm that says, the university should strive to recruit and appoint Catholics as professors so that to the extent possible, those committed to the witness of the truth will constitute a majority of the faculty. I've always maintained that this was a direction both wise and modest on the part of the Pope and the bishops. The bishops are smart and holy and uh, well-educated men, but they're not by profession scholars. What the Pope and the bishops have said in Ex Corde and in the application is that Catholic universities, not the bishops, are responsible for preserving and advancing the Catholic intellectual tradition. And for that very reason, the one thing we should insist on is that the universities hire faculties dedicated to doing that. This means the whole faculty, not just the school or the department of theology. So Newman argues for freedom, and he's right about that. What we really need to focus on is building a Catholic intellectual culture within uh, uh, the university, which the life of the mind, within which the life of the mind can flourish. And we do that by assembling the right people and encouraging the right projects, not by focusing on censorship. But you might be thinking, how can we be so sure that a genuinely Catholic faculty will build a genuinely Catholic intellectual culture? Why won't they want to be another Princeton or Williams or Harvey Mudd rather than Steubenville or the Catholic University of America? So this brings me to the second part of my uh, talk, and it's about a different sort of spirit, about the Holy Spirit and his gifts. Uh, in my town, in the National Gallery of Art, there's a wonderful painting of the Annunciation by Jan van Eyck, done around 1435. You probably know the one that I'm, that I'm talking about. I usually imagine that the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary at her 
home while she was praying. I, I picture one of those kind of open Italian country houses with no glass in the windows, but I, I know Mary wasn't Italian, I, but. <laughs> Uh, in Van Eyck's painting, Mary is in a temple reading a book. Big fat one, not one of those cute little Magnificat sized things you can put in your back <laughs> pocket. It's the size of the missal that the priest reads during uh, mass from the altar. And when the angel arrives uh, on, on Mary's uh, right or uh, left of the picture, Mary is doing what scholars do, pouring over the word of God. She's wearing a blue dress. I got that part right in my <laughs> imagination. Some think she has the face of Isabella of Portugal, whose husband, the Duke of Burgundy, occasionally employed Van Eyck as a court painter. Her husband is the guy who, who captured Joan of Arc and turned him over to the English. Incident. Almost like in the modern cartoons, the angel and Mary have these little word bubbles coming out of their mouths. The, the angel uh, says, Ave gratia plena, hail full of grace. And Mary replies, uh, Ecce Ancilla Domini, behold the handmaid of the Lord. Mary says upside down um, so that God can see it. You know. <laughs> in, in the upper level of the picture there are, are uh, these clerestory windows. And, and through the window on the left of the picture, there are seven rays of light shining down on Mary. They're, they're, they're painted in gold leaf. And riding on the middle beam and homing in on Mary is a dove with its wings outstretched. It's the Holy Spirit, and the seven rays of light are the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. How do I know this, you might say? <laughs> um, it's actually fairly natural to connect the Annunciation with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The first mention we have of the gifts of the Holy Spirit um, is in a passage in the prophet Isaiah, who, uh, who mentions the gifts when he prophesies about the coming of Christ. Here is what Isaiah says. A branch will sprout from the root of Jesse, and from his root a flower will rise up, and the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and of understanding, a spirit of counsel and of fortitude, a spirit of knowledge and of piety, and he shall be filled with the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Van Eyck's painting shows the fulfillment of that prophecy. When Mary says yes, the flower of Jesse rises up and the spirit of the Lord comes to rest on him. <clears throat> Mary herself is full of grace, as the angel says, because she receives those gifts. Theologians don't give as much attention to the gifts of the Holy Spirit as they once did, and, and uh, that's a pity, I think. But Pope Leo XIII, whom I want to talk about now, and who made Newman a cardinal, and who created both Newman's university and my own, did. Leo wrote 85 encyclicals during his 25 years as pope. Incidentally, <clears throat> he, he, he was made pope at age 68. People thought well, this was going to be a short termer, so we, <laughs> sort of like Francis, we, uh, we, uh, we don't need to worry because he's old. Uh, well, he lived for another 25 years. And um, in 1897 at Pentecost, he wrote, uh, published an encyclical called Divinum Illud Munis on the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> it's a letter that shows, I think, what a good theologian Van Eyck was. The letter begins by reminding us what the Creed says, that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Ghost. It then proceeds to say this. <coughs> Excuse me. No one can be surprised that all the gifts of the Holy Ghost inundated the soul of Christ. In him resided the absolute fullness of grace. In him were all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge and all other gifts foretold in the prophecies of Isaiah and also signified in that miraculous dove which appeared at the Jordan. This is how Van Eyck pictures the Annunciation and remember how he shows Mary to be a kind of intellectual reading a fat book in the, in the temple. Uh, Leo also connects that with the Holy Spirit who is, he says, the teacher the spirit of truth, whose all-powerful help guards us from ever falling into error. The big point I want to make in this section is this, that in a Catholic university like Newman's and like ours, we attend to both the spirit of freedom and the spirit of truth. I need to begin with some distinctions that 
maybe most interesting, if at all, to the philosophers in the crowd. But they will, I think, be helpful in understanding just what the gifts of the Holy Spirit are. You'll perhaps have noticed, uh, those of you who were big on Aristotle, that there is a considerable overlap between what we call the gifts of the Holy Spirit and what Aristotle calls the intellectual virtues. Isaiah's catalog of gifts again is this, wisdom, understanding, knowledge, counsel, fortitude, piety, and fear of the Lord. Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics offers this list of intellectual virtues, wisdom, understanding, knowledge, intelligence, prudence, art, and judgment. Why are some of these things virtues and others gifts? Leo would have had an answer to that question. He took an active interest in philosophy. In fact, he was a big fan of Aquinas. His 1879 encyclical, Eterni Patris, in fact, urges theologians to look to Thomas as a model. And Thomas, I, he, Thomas, I, I just, I, don't you just love him? He, uh, Thomas takes up this very question, how are the, vir the virtues different from the gifts? After, there's a long discussion in Prima Secunda in the, uh, in the Summa of the virtues, and at the end of that discussion, he takes up the gifts of the Holy Spirit and says, how are these different? In the, in the list of the seven gifts you, you may have observed, there are, there are four that bear, as it seems, on cognitive functions, wisdom, understanding, knowledge, counsel. And there are three that seem to concern our behavior or attitude or character, fortitude, piety, fear of the Lord. Aquinas notes how much the first group resemble the intellectual virtues in Aristotle and the second, the cardinal virtues in Aristotle. And fortitude is in fact one of the cardinal virtues. Piety, Thomas says, pertains to a kind of justice. But there are two important differences between the virtues of Aristotle and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, one has to do with where they originate, we might say. We acquire the cardinal virtues by practice until they become habitual. We may acquire the intellectual virtues in the same way, though they can be taught and they require the exercise of reason. Anyway, in both cases, the motion, as Aquinas calls it, originates with us. We are moved, he says, by our reason in our interior and exterior actions. The gifts, by contrast, are called gifts, he says, because they are infused by God. Isaiah does not actually use the word gifts. Remember, he says spirit. We receive the gifts by divine inspiration. That's actually the idea that Van Eyck was trying to convey. Mary doesn't receive the gifts because she has been good and studied hard all morning in the temple. She is literally inspired. The Holy Spirit comes to her. The second difference has to do with what the gifts do for us. Virtues enable us to act according to reason in all our affairs. Temperance governs our eating and drinking and other matters. Justice regulates our affairs in society. Wisdom helps us to reach intellectual truths. The gifts may also come into play in all these affairs where virtue may, but they dispose us to hear God's voice, not the voice of reason. And for that reason, uh, even young people and people with mental disabilities can possess the gifts. John of St. Thomas offers this metaphor, the very um, metaphor that uh, Father Terry used yesterday in, uh, in his talk. Picture a ship. He's thinking about a trireme, not about a carnival cruise liner, uh, <laughs> trying to make forward progress. Uh, here is what John of St. Thomas says. There is a vast difference in its being moved by the laborious rowing of oarsmen and its being moved by sails filled with a strong breeze. The oarsmen are the virtues trying to pull us in the direction reason indicates. The strong breeze is the Holy Spirit whom we often picture as a wind. It's easier to get to our destination with his help. But the metaphor allows for free will. We need to set the sails in such a way as to catch the wind if we, uh, if we want it to help us. Okay, um, let me now say a few things about the gifts and the university. 
In contemporary debates about religious higher education, we talk often about faith-based universities, about a tension between <coughs> faith and reason, about people who take propositions on faith, by which we mean without evidence. The central feature of these discussions is the assumption that we, in religious schools, are different because of the truth value we assign to certain propositions set out in the creed. Otherwise, we may be very much like our secular or private counterparts in the subjects we teach in the life we live on campus. I think that this greatly understates the uniqueness of our undertaking. In my discussion about Cardinal Newman, I pointed out that although we, like our counterparts, observe a spirit of academic freedom, we are nonetheless different in the faculty we hire, in the ambitions of our academic program. Here, in this section, I want to argue that the Holy Spirit is at work in forming our differences and that <clears throat> his inspiration is a very different thing from blind faith. Aquinas says that the gifts, all of them, have their origin not in the virtue of faith, but in the virtue of charity. He goes so far as to say this, whoever has charity has all the gifts of the Holy Ghost, none of which can one possess without charity. <clears throat> if you think about it, this should actually not be too surprising. The gifts are graces. It is because Mary is the handmaid of the Lord that she is, as the angel Gabriel acknowledges, full of grace. As a man and a woman who fall in love may give gifts to one another, so God showers his gifts on us as our relationship with him deepens. Two years ago, when we were celebrating our 125th anniversary at the Catholic University of America, we decided to focus on the virtue of charity by um, all of us faculty, students, alumni, staff, doing 125,000 hours of service. To some, it might have seemed odd or paradoxical that an academic institution should focus on that particular virtue. What do works of charity have to do with the quasquicentennial of a great research university, you might say? Well, quite a lot, if they lead to an increase in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> of course, the gifts are gratuitous, and it would be a mistake to suppose that we earn them like frequent flyer miles. In fact, <laughs> as Leo XIII points out, we first receive them in baptism. In this sacrament, and more abundantly in confirmation, he says, the charity of God is poured out into our hearts by the Holy Ghost who is given to us. We receive like graces in the other sacraments. This is why the Mass, the sacraments, and the life of prayer are central features in the life of a Catholic university. It's not just that these are big parts of our lives, like regular exercise, though more important, which we provide on campus for ease of scheduling. Rather, they are entwined with our academic life as the gifts of the Holy Spirit are. One of the great mistakes of secular ideology is the notion that we should separate the principles and practices of our faith from the rest of our civic life. It's a similar mistake to suppose that the practice of religion is something distinct from our intellectual life. In the life of a Catholic university, I should also say the practice of our religion is a corporate undertaking. Baptism is a reception into the church. The mass is the church at prayer, a collective act of worship. Leo notes in Divinum Illud Munis that the church came to life on Pentecost when it received the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And while some among us may fall out of grace from time to time, the Holy Spirit, he says, perpetually supplies life and strength to preserve and increase the church. He guards her by his all-powerful help from ever falling into error. For this reason, it's both natural and necessary that a Catholic university should maintain a union with the church. That's the point of ex corde ecclesiae, in fact. Every Catholic university, it says, without ceasing to be a university, has a relationship to the church that is essential to its institutional identity. 
Okay, I'm, I'm about to wrap up, but I still have one last point to make about, about the gifts and about their effect on the intellectual life of the university. The, the rays of light in Van Eyck's painting are steady beams, you know, they're, they're straight lines it, uh, in gold leaf. They're, they're not a burst of light, they're not a flash of light. The, uh, and the, his choice of light as a symbol rather than, say, strength or teleportation or telekinesis or some other superpower he, um, is also meaningful. The rays of light can help us to see more clearly as we go on our intellectual wanderings. The gift of knowledge, for example, keeps the saints, those who truly love God, from falling into errors and confusion in faith and morals. How exactly does this happen? Inspiration is not just a religious experience. In the popular story, Newton comprehended the law of gravity when an apple fell from a tree and hit him on the head. More uh, recently, Einstein grasped the special theory of relativity after watching the clock tower in Bern from a tram he was sitting on uh, as it pulled away from him. I'm not going to insist that the Holy Spirit was at work in either case, but both examples, I think, show how the human mind can be carried to the truth by mysterious processes that are different from um, logic and science. Here's a different kind of example. I used to work for a wise old lawyer who would review cases with us as they came into the office. And when presented with a hard or novel problem, he would often think it over and say, the, uh, the right answer to this question is thus and so. Um, I don't know how you get there, but if you do some research, I think you'll find that I'm right. And he always was. <laughs> His intuitive sense of the right solution may, I, I think, have been based on the experience of having seen thousands of other cases. But I can think of examples that don't seem to be based on experience of this kind. I, let me allow me to use my mother, who grew up in a small town in western Pennsylvania and attended second-rate parochial and public schools, as I did, and graduated, as she used to say, sine laude from Mercyhurst College in Erie. <laughs> After the war, she was a housewife and a mother of eight, and she didn't read much, apart from her breviary. She was, though, a good and holy woman, and she had the most unfailingly correct judgment about moral issues. When one of her children or grandchildren was contemplating a course of action and the rest of us were engaged in debate about whether it was right or wise or just, she, she would say, w w jumping from, from first to last without any intermediate steps, I think that's a mistake or I would do this instead. And years after the fact, we have uh, seen her assessments borne out. How did she do that? John of St. Thomas, whom I mentioned before, describes this kind of knowing, the gift of the Holy Spirit, as connatural. It is, as uh, another scholar says, the difference between merely knowing about and having. One can know all about morality or religion, for example, but live an immoral or faithless life. Connatural means that knowledge is not only intellectual, but has become second nature to us, much as the skill of an athlete who can perform remarkable, graceful moves with no apparent effort. The gifts of the Holy Spirit enable us to see things as God would see them. I suggested a moment ago that God showers his gifts on us as a man and a woman in love might bestow gifts on one another. Here's an extension of that idea. Being in love helps people see the world through the eyes of another. After nearly 40 years of marriage, I can guess with near certainty how my wife will react to most things. More important, I have come to see things in her way and to share her judgment about them, things that I once thought differently about. And it's like this with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They are grounded, as Thomas says, in the love of God and they help us to see things through God's eyes. This is true in our deliberations about difficult moral questions. 
it may be equally true about the perception of beauty or the understanding of scripture or many of the other things we do at a university. So, um, so there you have the idea of a Catholic university as Newman and Leo would have it. It combines in equal measure freedom and inspiration, but the environment is designed for a faculty and students who love God and the inspiration is the gift of the Holy Spirit for those who love him. Thank you.